France, 1760. The wonder man of Europe runs for his life. No records exist of his birth, death, or true identity. He was considered a genius in art, music, politics, and alchemy. Although he looked 40, many believed he was at least 150 years old. He called himself the Count of Saint Germain. Others called him the man who would not die. at Versailles in 1757 rides the last great crest of regal splendor before the French Revolution. Embroiled in a bitter war with England, King Louis XV still plays host to the leading thinkers and doers of Europe. The Count of Saint Germain is welcomed as a man of wealth and obvious breeding. A brilliant violinist, he conducts entire symphonies without referring to written music. He is also a talented painter and his descriptions of ancient history cause listeners to believe that he experienced the events himself. In recreations based on actual memoirs, Saint Germain fascinates the elite of France, including Voltaire, Madame Pompadour, and especially King Louis. I liked and admired the man. In his way, he was brilliant. A scientist and a historian. He amused and astounded me. Why, once he removed a large flaw from this very beautiful diamond and uh, tripled its worth. <laughs> I set him up in a laboratory at the Triana. He used to teach me chemistry. He even said I had a natural aptitude for it. During years spent in India, St. Germain supposedly learned how to remove flaws from diamonds and change base metals to gold. It was written that he performed both feats often enough to dissuade doubters. Skilled as a chemist, it was also rumored that he possessed a magic elixir of life. St. Germain neither confirmed nor denied anything said about him. How old was he? 100? 200? 2,000 years? He either smiled or responded with cheerful evasiveness. He spoke at least a dozen languages so fluently that in any country he visited, he was accepted as a native. But where was he actually from? Portugal, Egypt, Atlantis. The fog-shrouded Carpathian mountains of Transylvania have hidden many legendary figures. One might have been Saint Germain as a small boy. When Prince Franz Rakoczy lost control of Hungary, his two older sons were placed under house arrest in Vienna. His third son, possibly Saint Germain, traveled secretly from Transylvania to Florence and the protection of the House of Medici. If this story, one of so many, is true, it would explain Saint Germain's extraordinary education and appreciation of fine art. According to memoirs, the Count was slim, well-proportioned, and of medium height. His features were pleasant, and his eyes possessed a great fascination. Those who looked into them were profoundly influenced. His sense of humor and courtly manner made him especially attractive to women. Among them, King Louis' mistress, Madame Pompadour. He was a truly delightful person, and he knew all of the European languages. And he was very entertaining. The king, you know, is easily bored, but never by Saint-Germain. And yet there was a mystery to him. Nobody knew where he came from or his true identity. And there was a strangeness. Some of my very elderly friends at court said they had known him for 50 years, and yet he never seemed to age. If he had a magic elixir of life, <laughs> I wish he had given some to me. Casanova, the Italian opportunist, resented his rival's success. Saint-Germain is a charlatan. 
and an imposter. He thinks he's a prodigy in everything. Oh, he's very clever. And with his tricks, he has the capability to amuse. He can make the women admire him. But then, I know something of the ladies myself. One very mysterious thing. In all of the banquets we have attended together, I have never seen him eat one morsel of food. While his peers gorged at banquets, Saint Germain dined alone on light portions of cereal, vegetables, and the white meat of chicken. Was this his secret for long life? Small, balanced meals? Voltaire, France's aging intellectual, expressed great admiration for Saint Germain. He is a very learned man in the Freemason. His knowledge of history is so extraordinary, it makes one believe he lived through the events himself. One could believe it would take more than one lifetime to absorb so much knowledge. Thus, the man must be immortal. He was so knowledgeable in politics and history that I used to send him on secret missions to make peace with England, but ah, that was my mistake. I went over the head of my foreign minister, who naturally was furious. Of course, I had to pretend that I knew nothing of the affair. Choiselle was going to arrest him, but he escaped and disappeared. <laughs> Envious of Saint Germain's influence on the king, Choiseul, Louis's foreign minister, ordered him arrested and shot as an English spy. Choiseul circulated vicious rumors throughout Europe, claiming that Saint Germain was a Portuguese of questionable parentage who married for money in Mexico and absconded to Turkey with his wife's jewels. Saint Germain escaped to the English Channel and crossed safely to London. However, Choiseul's ugly stories followed him wherever he wandered, even to Russia. In Saint Petersburg, Saint Germain joined a conspiracy to overthrow Tsar Peter in 1762. Battlefield strategies brought victory to the forces of Catherine the Great. Once enthroned, the new queen rewarded him with the title General Well Done. The legend of the brilliant count preceded him to the distinguished courts and drawing rooms of Europe. Wherever he traveled, Saint Germain was welcomed as a scholar, a scientist, and raconteur. Most of his activities were shrouded in mystery, but it is known that he formed secret societies dealing with the occult and warned the crowned heads of many nations that the collapse of the French monarchy would eventually doom them as well. His one known manuscript, the Most Holy Trinisophia, written in a combination of modern languages and ancient hieroglyphics, is considered a classic of occult literature. The final years of Saint Germain's known life was spent in Hesse Castle, Germany. He divided his time between experiments in alchemy and meetings of his secret societies. Few people knew Saint Germain as well as Prince Charles, his last known confidant and benefactor. In 1784, word spread across Europe that Saint Germain lay mortally ill in the castle of Prince Charles. I was privileged to be a very good friend of Saint Germain. In fact, he spent his last years here in this very castle. Some time before he died, he confided in me his true identity. He was the third son of Prince Franz Leopold Rakuzzi of Transylvania. When the Austro-Hungarian Empire absorbed his enormous estates, he spirited his third son away to Italy where he was uh, looked after and brought up by the Medici family and attended the University of Siena. This, of course, uh, 
was one of the reasons for his his very uh, charming uh, demean, his aristocratic uh, bearing, his wealth, and his great knowledge. Unfortunately, he died here in this castle. Did Prince Charles attend the funeral? No. Now until you come to mention it, I didn't. Uh, I was away at the time. There are no records of St. Germain's burial. Ten years later, he was sighted in Paris at the height of the French Revolution. Sightings continued well into the 19th century, and for some, continued today. Elizabeth Clare Prophet, leader of the Church Universal and Triumphant in Pasadena, California, believes that St. Germain speaks to the world through her. Who was St. Germain is really a very important question for America and for freedom-loving peoples in every nation today. St. Germain has embodied again and again over many centuries, as we all have. Our souls continue to evolve and to experience on Earth until we perfect our own individual calling. Back in the days of Atlantis, St. Germain figures as a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He was tending the flame of freedom in an ancient temple. Word came to him from his teacher that the continent would sink. And he was told to travel from the continent by ship to go to Europe in what is now the area of Transylvania in the Transylvanian foothills to plant the flame of freedom. Transylvania was in Hungary and is now in Romania. St. Germain did this and the placing of that flame of freedom there was the beginning of the house of Rakazi, the royal house of Hungary. According to Mrs. Prophet, this is just the beginning of a series of fantastic lives. Elizabeth Clare Prophet believes that St. Germain has appeared on Earth at key moments in history. After the ascension of Jesus Christ, Joseph of Arimathea traveled by ship to the British Isles with the cup used at the Last Supper. That cup became the spiritual force field for the Knights of the Round Table, the coming of Arthur. In that episode, Saint Germain incarnated as Merlin the Magician. Again the alchemist, again the great prophet and seer, the spiritual power behind the throne. He gives the vision to Camelot. And so that focus in England begins the opportunity for Saint Germain to bring the teachings of Christ to the New World. And so he incarnates as none other than Christopher Columbus. The master Saint Germain arrived at the New World at San Salvador, very near the ancient retreat of Atlantis, which had sunk when Atlantis went down 12,000 years earlier. Saint Germain then ascended and he went forth as the immortal, very closely connected with the courts of Europe. A book has been written about him based on the diaries of Madame Dadimar. And this book contains the record of the wonder man of Europe as he appeared and disappeared throughout the courts of Europe over a period continuously over 200 years. He astonished those around him. He appeared uh, youthful. He wore diamonds on every finger. He precipitated jewels. But his main mission was to warn the heads of state of the coming cataclysm that ensued in the French Revolution. All that he predicted came to pass. Still having the desire to form a United States of Europe, he contacted Napoleon to form that unity. But the power transferred to Napoleon, Napoleon misused. He went power mad and instead he met his Waterloo. Dr. Peter Ryle, professor of European history at UCLA, holds a different viewpoint. I think Saint-Germain was a typical adventurer of the 18th century. He was a man similar to uh, Casanova, similar to Cagliostro, similar to a whole slew of men who populated the last half of the 18th century, plying the trade of uh, mystical uh, religion, uh, pseudoscience, in an attempt to milk as much money as they could from the rich, the wealthy, and the gullible. Dr. Manuel Oderberg of the Theosophical Society. I feel personally that um, Saint-Germain was one 
of a number of highly trained people who uh, seem to come before mankind or in different countries from time to time to restate certain uh, ethical principles. He had universal ideas about humanity per se rather than any one particular country. And secondly, that um, he was, he himself in his own personal life was pitched to what I might call unselfishness. People like Saint-Germain and Cagliostro could come in and partly use the scientific ideas that were floating about and partly accept them because they were not totally phonies. I'm not trying to say that. But they really were, were people who read a little of this and a little of that, took the latest scientific statements and also made a great deal of money out of it or at least as much money as they could. At that time, then, he turned his attention to the United States, where he had already been working behind the scenes with George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, in actually preparing the Constitution of the United States and inspiring that declaration, as well as the revolution, the freedom of those independent colonies. Just at the moment of indecision, at precisely 5 o'clock, July 4th, 1776, St. Germain appeared on the balcony. The doors remained locked, but he appeared. He gave an impassioned speech to the delegates, and he told them to sign that document. And the energy that he released was so intense that immediately they coalesced, and they all signed the document, beginning with John Hancock. As to the length of Saint Germain's life, once again the experts disagree. Saint Germain's supposed longevity is again a traditional ploy used by people who claim to be magicians or alchemists to prove that they have discovered the magic elixir of life. The, the fact of not eating in public, I think, is a very, very, very intelligent ploy of showing that somehow you ingest different types of foods as normal human beings do. There was a rumor that he had died in 1784, but there are memoirs by the Comtesse d'Andema, um, the French lady-in-waiting to Marie Antoinette, uh, indicating that he was seen um, after 1784, uh, and in fact for some years afterwards. So what I really meant was that it wasn't a fact that he had died in 1784. During Saturday evening church services in Pasadena, Elizabeth Clare Prophet claimed that St. Germain speaks to his followers through her. I am the keeper of the flame of freedom for every nation. St. Germain, you have called me, and Uncle Sam. I am he, and I am here. I am in the flame of the holy science and of that religion which is yours to claim. Yes, I come, a believer and a teacher of the law of reincarnation. The law of the coming again and again of the soul is your cosmic justice. It is that cause of freedom whereby you understand that the goal and the calling of America and every true free nation is to lead mankind into that way of higher consciousness. This is my mantra, which I give to you. I am a being of violet fire. I am the purity God desires. Hail Saint Germain.
Evidence recently discovered in the library of the British Museum indicates that St. Germain might well have been the lost third son of Prince Rikoji, born in Transylvania in 1694. If he died in Germany in 1784, he lived 90 years. The average life expectancy in the 18th century was 35 years. 50 was a ripe old age. 90 was forever. We can account for those 90 years with a reasonable amount of confidence. St. Germain's lives before and after that, however, are a matter of faith.